It's podcast day. It's podcast day. Welcome in, friends. Hello and welcome to the Hey Brownberry YouTube channel. My name is Marcelin and I welcome you here to my making journal. This podcast is a little bit different than the usual because I just came up with a thought a few minutes ago and I thought I would bring you along with me on this idea. Today is Thursday, November 24th, and that is the Thanksgiving holiday in the U.S. So I'm about three or four hours away from meeting up with our family. We're gathering at my sister-in-law's house to have the traditional Thanksgiving meal with some Caribbean West Indian favorites sprinkled in like we always do. Whenever you're watching this, maybe you have already done something similar and feel free to tell me in the comments how it was for you. So one of the things I was thinking about in preparing for today's gathering is what project am I going to be working on? Any activity like this means there will be drive time in the car. We're going about an hour away, drive time back home. That's two hours of sitting. And then while I am with my family, often whether the food is ready or not, you have some sit down time, visiting, hanging out, chatting, catching up. So I need a project. My current project, which I will put a picture of here, is a top that I'm working on. And it's Hadid by Lana Joy. It's going great so far. I'm sure I'll tell you about that in another video. But it is at a point where after several more rounds, I'm going to have to do a try on because I modified a lot of things and I want to try it on before I get to the next kind of critical step in the project. I'm not sure that I want to do that while I am peopling. So I want something simpler and this idea came to me. This is the time of year when a lot of organizations are collecting things to give to those in the community who may be struggling financially or could just use a bit of help. And I'm all for that. In years past, I've done things like contributed to food drives and given to organizations that provide handmade items like hats and scarves and other things. So along those lines, I'm thinking that I'm going to try for a one day hat. I'm going to go to my stash, find probably the chunkiest yarn I can manage and see if I can finish a hat in the time that it takes me to Prepare for leaving the house, travel to see family, be with family, and come back. So, right now, it is 11.27 a.m. We're supposed to have dinner around 3 or 4, and I'm just going to record how far I get. And the goal will be to finish a hat that I can then give to a charitable organization. And whatever organization I choose, I am going to share that with you. I'll put links to it in the video description. And then that way, if you want to do something like that, especially because it is winter in much of North America, actual cold winter, not, not Florida winter. <laughs> so um, if you see this video in time and want to make something similar for someone who could really use some warmth this season, then feel free to join me. I'm not sure what pattern I'm going to do yet. I'm not even sure if I'm going to do a pattern yet. You're just getting all of this live and unfiltered from my brain. So come along with me. We are in the craft room, friends, and the first thing I want to choose is my yarn. And as I said, to be successful with this plan, I'm going to need a thicker yarn, something that will knit up quickly. Got some good options. This one is a Navajo churro. This is a single ply churro wool. And I actually really love this color. I think I only have one skein of this. It looks a little heavier than worsted. Another good option is this Lopi style. DK weight Shetland mohair mix, which I have already knit with, so I know that I love working with it. And even though it's DK, that's a decent size. If I'm just making an adult size hat, I could probably get through that in several hours of knitting. Love this grayish brown color, too.
This is a Jill Draper Makes Shiraz. The danger here is that this is so much my color. I might not want to give it away when it's done. Ooh. This one is a Cheviot yarn, which is kind of cool and different. Looks like I have a good amount of slightly heavier weight yarns. And when I say that, it's because I normally am working on a sport or a DK weight. And so my stash has a good amount of the chunkier things left over still. Another option I considered is combining two yarns to make something slightly heavier, more halo-y. This is a West Wool DK and a Silk Mohair. This Silk Mohair is one that I naturally dyed with plants. And I kind of like how they look just next to each other. And I suspect that they might work up into a really nice green. Hmm. I'm sincerely tempted by this because I just want to see how they look together. So I don't know. I don't know yet what to choose. Um, I want something nice and wooly in the hands, so I'm really tempted by some of those single ply wooly wools. But the color combination here is drawing me in as well. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. Which one would you go for? I mean, I could always start with one and then if I just get on a kick, I can <laughs> make one of the other choices and make a hat in that as well. Oh my goodness, right? Maker problems. Well, we'll see shortly what I decide. Editing Mars here, interrupting myself to say that while I was doing this project, I realized that having started it along with you, it was a great opportunity for me to share some tips and tricks that I use, things that I do very commonly when I'm starting a project, especially a project in the round. So I guess that's a bit of a bonus in this episode is some of my favorite tips and tricks when working this kind of project. One of the things I've learned from packing up travel projects in the past is in order to be the most successful, it's better for me to start the cast on at home. Have you ever been through this where you get yourself all set up for a project and you pack up everything that you need for that project, but something happens in the cast on or in reading the instructions while you're already on the trip, the road trip or the event or activity, and the project just doesn't start off correctly? I would rather get rid of all of that while I'm here at the house and just launch and make sure I have what I need, that I'm using the needles that I like and so on before I even get in the car. So I'm going to go to my needle stash. This is where I keep most of my circular needles. I'm gonna figure out what needle size is gonna work best for the project and cast on from now. The amount of mohair fuzz, <laughs> it's okay, it'll make a very warm hat. Should we pick a project bag while we're at it? Yes, yes we should. Oh, here's a nice one by Daisy Lane Design that always, always calls to me. Such talent. Here's one that I made on a weekend retreat with some friends. And I'm quite proud of it. And it's about the right size for a hat. Let's see, another hat sized one. Oh, here's one. This is a nice one that is very simple, but I can't remember exactly where I ordered this from. It's got a gorgeous canvas back and bottom and an easy carry strap. Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. You'll see later on in the video which one of these I decided to stick the project in for today. We're not gonna to be too precious about lighting today, are we? We are grateful for the sun and its light, even when it gives it intermittently as you're trying to film. We are grateful. I'm going to pick a needle size. Because I have 
combined the silk mohair with another DK before, I kind of have some idea that I'm either gonna need a US 8 five millimeter needle or even a US 9, US 9 in millimeters. I don't use it often, so I'll put here what that is. And I wanna knit in the round, because that's pretty speedy versus knitting and then seaming up the hat. So I have some nice Licka needles. I think this cable would be long enough for magic loop on a hat, I think. I'm not sure though. I also have another favorite, which is my Chowgu red lace needles. Those are metal and those are in a US 8 on a 32 inch cable. Again, pretty sure I could magic loop with these. Not sure, I have interchangeable options. So this is part of why I try to do the cast on before I leave home is because I want to cast on a number of stitches, see how the yarn works with the needles. Does it glide smoothly or not? Does my magic loop work? Do I need a longer cable? I, have to, I wanna figure all of that out before I get in the car. It avoids me having to take the entire collection of needles with me. You see what I'm saying? As I said, I have interchangeable options, so if I do need a longer cable, then I can do that. I can um, use my wood or metal Knit Picks needle tips, maybe a 40-inch cable, 47-inch even, because the hat is going to be a good size. I'm going to make an adult size hat. My head is 23 inches in circumference, which tends to be on the larger end. <laughs> Um, it's a larger size in any hat pattern that I've seen, which in the adults range from like 18 to 22 inches, sometimes 23 is included in there. And I'm thinking that I will just cast on 80 to 100 stitches, I haven't decided yet. By the way, I have decided that I'm just not gonna bother looking for a pattern because that's another step and I've knit hats before. I am going to assume that I can do the math for gauge. So if I'm getting about five stitches to the inch, um, let me do some quick calculation here. So just running some quick math. If I have about four stitches to the inch in my gauge and I cast on 80 stitches, that should give me a 20 inch circumference for the uh, brim of the hat, so the widest part. And if I'm knitting at about five stitches to the inch, I'm going to need about 100 stitches for a 20 inch brim. So not knowing exactly what my gauge is gonna be and fully admitting that I am not going to gauge swatch for this hat, I think I will cast on 90 stitches. So somewhere right in between. And I feel like the gauge that I'll get on this combined yarn is gonna be somewhere between four and five stitches to the inch on a US nine needle. And that's gonna be the, just the numbers that I play with to see what my gauge ends up, uh, where my gauge ends up. I will do a ribbed brim so that it will be stretchy and a stockinette body in the hat. And I'll probably knit it to about 10 inches total. So it might be a little slouchy. Um, that includes the crown decreases. These are all plots and plans. We're gonna see how far I get today. <laughs> I like the idea of being somewhat loose, somewhat free, but also giving myself permission to reroute at any point in this project. I'm so glad you're here with me. Um, if by any chance you also decided to do this kind of uh, charitable knitting, let me know in the comments what kinds of projects you like when you're doing your knitting or crochet or any other craft for the purpose of giving, the, giving it away. What's your favorite giveaway item that's handmade? Okay, so off I go to pick a needle and cast on. So a time-saving tip when I am casting on, and I'm going to use the long tail cast on, but I don't want to measure out or guess at the length of yarn that I need for that long tail cast on, and I don't want to run out of yarn while I'm casting on. I saw this, I believe one of the first times I saw it demonstrated was by the Sexy Knitter on Instagram. And uh, that's my friend Sarah, and she showed how you can use both ends from your yarn cake to do the long tail cast on, and you never run out. So you basically take the end of yarn from the outside of the ball, 
and the end of the yarn on your center pull, take it from the center, take those two strands together, you make a slip knot, so you make a slip knot in the end of your yarn, and that gives you two stitches that you then put onto your needle. Snug that up, oops, and then you would use the two strands from each end of the yarn to do your long tail cast on. Maybe you're already familiar with this cast on. So in this case, what happens is you're pulling from both parts of the yarn cake and you just never run out. You just cast on however many stitches you need. And then when you're ready to join in the round or begin your row, you can just count that first double stitch as one and knit those two together so you don't uh, end up with an extra stitch. Or you can knit them as two and just count that in your total, two individual ones. So in this case, I want that freedom of not having to figure out what length I need to cast on my 90 stitches. So I'm going to have to pull from both ends of this cake and both ends of this cake. It's just the easiest way for me to not have to guess. So I'm actually going to have four strands working. That's part of working a double-stranded project. No big deal. At least I will have the ease of getting my 90 stitches on the needle without much fuss. So I'm going to treat the two strands from my solid green yarn and ooh, the mohair center pull end is going to be a little hard to find. Got it! <laughs> So I'm going to treat this set of two strands as another strand. I am literally figuring this out as I go. We don't go for perfection here. We go for progress. So if I take those two, double strand of each, and I make myself a slip knot, with all four strands, easier said than done. Right, so now I have my slip knot with all four strands. The yarn is just gonna keep pulling and pulling. And what I can do is take a strand of mohair, I'm sorry if I'm blocking my face, I'm gonna take a strand of mohair and a strand of my solid yarn here and make that one and the other strand of mohair and the other strand of solid yarn. Make that two. I did decide to go with the interchangeable needles and get a slightly longer cable. So I'm gonna put my slip knot on. Talk amongst yourselves while I fiddle here and snug up my slip knot. The trick with the slip knot is to pull on the short ends to snug it up. I tell you, the halo from this mohair yarn, I'm already having to really pay attention to where things are going, and it's very sticky. I'm going to start my long tail. I will not be discouraged by this mess in my lap. One yarn cake is going to go down on the floor, the other one is sitting next the other one is sitting next to me on the couch <laughs> and we're going to make this happen. And I'm actually going to do a German twisted cast on. So that is going to give me a really stretchy brim. I like the German twisted cast on for particularly for its stretch. It's very similar in appearance to the long tail cast on, and it's very similar in execution. There's just one extra step. I will put a link to a tutorial for the German twisted cast on in the description box. It seems, you know, a bit convoluted right now, working with a fuzzy yarn, working with two yarn cakes, um, double strand, casting on a lot of stitches, but that's okay. This is why we start this part at home where I am relaxed and I have time and I can get all the wiggles out before we start the road trip portion of the day. You can see I have one strand of each going 
and forming some nice stitches. Some nice fuzzy stitches, beautiful halo already. And this cast on has, like I said, about the same look as the long tail. Today is one of those overcast days, so the clouds keep coming by and <laughs> changing my view out the window, changing the light in the room, but right now I have a lot of good light for seeing these stitches. Now, tell me if you do anything special when you're casting on to keep your count. If I have a really high number of stitches to cast on, I tend to use re, um, removable stitch markers so that I don't have to do one big count at the end. But for anything under 100, I just kind of keep casting on until I feel like I've come close to my number and then I'll count. And wherever I am at that point, um, when I stop and decide to count, then from there I will count each stitch as I make them until I get to my total. Do you have a method that you like? I know um, I've seen folks do the marker method every 10 or 20 or so, just make it really easy on yourself. But as you can tell, I'm looking to do as little as possible in the way of getting this project going, including going to look for removable stitch markers and stopping to put them on. <laughs> And I, it's not because I'm feeling stressed about this in any way. I'm actually kind of having fun uh, putting this together and as I'm doing it, thinking about the ways that I work to kind of get momentum behind a project. Even though I'm zooming through the start of this project, that's not always my method. Um, quite often, especially if I'm going to do a larger project, I take a good amount of time to get going. I will spend a day reading the pattern and making sure I understand how, let's say, a garment is going to come together, what adjustments I might need to make, just getting used to the designer's writing style, um, and then I'll swatch. And swatching can be a couple days worth of effort if you're going to, for example, knit a large enough swatch that you can then soak or wet or steam block and let it sit, maybe overnight and see how the yarn changes in that process once it's dried. Picking of the needles just like I did today, sometimes I will cast on and not be happy with my first selection of needles and go through a few iterations with that. So there are most likely several days worth of getting going if I'm doing a project, especially a larger one. If I'm already familiar with the yarn or the designer and that sort of thing, that cuts down on a lot of the time. So me zooming through this cast on has everything to do with just kind of wanting to test out this hat in a day process. So I've reached what looks to me like, oh, somewhere close to my 90 stitches now. So I'm gonna stop and count and then see if I have more or less than I need. As I'm first beginning to work with this yarn, I am learning a lot about the properties of the yarn. First lesson, this silk mohair is grabby and double-stranded by itself is fine, but double-stranded with this other yarn, just trying to keep it separate enough to make my new stitches, my cast-on stitches, I'm having to tug it apart. In the project itself, that's going to be great because it wants to stick next to the other. It wants to stick next to the other yarn. All of its halo is grabbing onto the other yarn, which should make it easier for me to get my needle through each stitch without splitting them. Learning about the properties of this, I'm not sure I would knit an all mohair project, like knit with just the mohair by itself. Have you ever done that? I can see that it might make a nice soft pillowy fabric but I wonder what it would be like to actually move the stitches along and get your needle into them properly. Hmm, I don't know. I am enjoying this color combo though. It's an olivey green, uh, golden, a golden green almost. I quite like it. I think it's going to make a nice fabric. 
and I believe I am done with my 90 stitches, but I'm going to count them all up just to double check. 89. <laughs> I cast on 89. So here's that last one. Now that I have used both ends of the yarn cake, another key to this cast on trick is you've got to pick which end you're going to snip and which end you're going to leave to work with. So if you prefer working from the center of the cake, then you want to snip the outside yarn and vice versa. So I'm gonna take my time and do that and not try to do it while I'm thinking about the camera for uh, both cakes of yarn. But we're, we're at the point of joining in the round and starting our ribbing. I mentioned a little bit ago that I'm learning about the yarns as I'm casting them on and working with them. This has so many flyaways in it and it's so fuzzy that I thought of another tip or trick here I have a remnant of a sock that is too small for me. I think it might have belonged to one of my kids at some point, but um, because I can no longer wear it, <laughs> I'm going to use it to hold my yarn cake together and also keep the flyaways down. And I just cut off the top of the sock and the toe. It's that stretchy kind of jersey type material and I'm going to put my yarn cake inside it See there and this should minimize the amount of mohair that's just flying all over the place into my face and eyes without limiting my access to that center pole section you can use this for any yarn ball, but I think in this case it's very practical and because the sock has some uh, elasticity to it as the cake shrinks, it'll just kind of shrink along with it. So hopefully that will make this easier when it's in my project bag. It is 12.50 and I am starting the first round. Just marking that time. <laughs> I think we'll be leaving the house in about an hour or so. I don't do I don't do a lot of projects with uh, mohair. I've done one main one so far where I was carrying a strand of mohair, and I do notice that what is a bit slower is pulling the mohair out of the center of the cake. I hope I haven't made a mistake in doing the mohair cake as the center pull strand. We'll see. It's not a big deal. It means that when I need more yarn, I need to kind of stop and pull out a length. Totally doable, but not the smoothest rhythm, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to continue with the garter brim and hope to make some good progress between now and the time we get in the car and maybe by the time we're in the car it will be smoother sailing on this brim. I'm going to be sitting a lot today so I figured I would do a round or two standing up. <laughs> give the back a different position These needles are working well, but as I'm moving through the rounds, I thought of another tip I could share with you for smoothing out your knitting in the round. That tip is to use two different needle tips if you have interchangeable needles when knitting in the round to smooth out the knitting. So when you're knitting in the round, one needle end is always creating the stitches, working right to left. So you're always going into your last round of stitches with that needle end and knitting or purling with that same needle tip the whole time. 
The other needle end and cable is responsible for just holding the unworked stitches until it's their turn. That needle end that's just holding the stitches can be a smaller needle tip if you have an interchangeable needle set and can change out that tip for a smaller size than your working needle. And what that does is it makes it easier for the stitches to slide into position to be worked. And I have found that when working in the round, this really does make a difference in the rhythm of the knitting. So I've got size nine needle tips on here and I'm gonna leave a size nine on my working needle so that I create that stitch size. But I'm gonna to switch to a size six, I think, for the needle tip that's just responsible for holding the stitches in queue to be worked. And that should make them slide along really easily. So to clarify, this is a trick that works with magic loop knitting in particular and only in the round. This back needle, the one that has the yarn attached to it, the working yarn, is the needle that I pull out and begin to work the stitches for each part of the round. This needle here, which is closest to me and does not have the working yarn attached, is the one that just holds the stitches ready for knitting. So this is the one that I am going to change to a smaller size. And this is the beauty of interchangeable needles. So thankful for whoever invented these is that I can take off this size nine needle tip and put on a size six needle tip. And I went down several sizes so that the movement of the stitches will be really obvious. Get that on there nice and tight. So as I'm preparing to begin working the next round, the stitches are gonna move very easily along here. And that's because they've been formed with a size nine needle tip. That's the size of the stitches. And they have plenty of room to glide on the size six needle tip. So hopefully you'll try that next time you're working Magic Loop in the round. I'm gonna keep going on this hat brim. Hello friends, it is late, late, uh, 9.23, I was gonna say late evening, but that's, it's night. <laughs> and we are back from Thanksgiving Day family gathering and I'm having a reflection about this project. Um, I did not stitch on this project at all during the family gathering today. I helped prepare some of the, um, I, I did a little bit of preparation of the food with my sister-in-law and then just helped getting things set up, talked to everybody who was near me <laughs> in the gathering, and helped clean up a good bit at the end. And ate a little bit too, which was good. Delicious food. But at no point, literally at no point, did I just sit down. Which is when I would have knit, but I didn't do that. So... I knit some more on the way home in the car. And now, this many hours later, I'm reflecting on kind of the frenetic energy that I had to, to do this project. And I 100% recognize that this was my expression of a bit of anxiety going into this social activity and wanting to have a thing that was just going to be part of it and that I could control. So I'm totally recognizing that. I haven't watched back the footage of myself from earlier, but I already know that a lot of that was built into like, 
I just want to have something for me and it would be great if it'd be something that I feel good about finishing in a short amount of time that I can give to someone somewhere and feel good about that giving. Just a bit of chaos, let's be honest. <laughs> Nevertheless, I am going to continue with the project, um, but not very much got done today. I got a good portion of the brim knit, so the rest of it will we'll carry on with tomorrow. I'll see you there. Good morning, my friends. An update on this, uh, this podcast project. It's looking lovely in this morning light and uh, you can see some progress has been made. I finished the brim. I haven't measured it. I would guess that it's two inches plus, maybe two and a half. Today's first reflection as I've gotten into the stockinette section is that I really, really like the feel of this fabric with the mohair mixed in, the silk mohair. I'm not accustomed to this vlog style, so I'm trying to keep the camera as still as possible. Yeah, I love the feel of this fabric. It's very soft. It does have the kind of halo that you'd expect. I wonder if I can get that on camera. She fuzzy. But I'm enjoying that. It's moving along really smoothly on the needles. I guess the metal needles were a good choice for this. And the only kind of pausing I have is that initial pull of some length of the strands out of the ball. So far so good. I already know this is not a hat in a day project. I'm trying to be kind to my hands so I am taking breaks. But I hope to have a good amount of inches done later in the day. I'll see you there. Quick check-in, just uh, 10.58 a.m. now. Just shy of 12 hours from the first snippets of this video being recorded yesterday, and I'm happy with my progress. But I'm also realizing that now is a good time to just invite some calm into this project. I started thinking about what I intend for this hat, which is to give it away to someone, and I'm conscious of putting some of that good feeling and warmth and ease into the stitches themselves, which might sound a bit woo, but it's how I feel. I feel like the energy that I put into the project could carry over to the wearer. So I came to my craft room to sit and stitch for a bit. It's an overcast Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving. We had a family gathering yesterday with some delicious food prepared by my sister-in-law. And you saw uh, on my Instagram, actually, I posted just a short clip of my stitching time on the brim of this hat while we were on our way there. So I did get a little bit done yesterday, but much more today on this lovely long weekend Friday. Sitting in this particular seat in my craft room, it's often where I am when I podcast, has a calming effect. I can see out my window into the backyard, something about the green out there, the birds, sometimes the bunnies that come by, really soothes me. And I think my brain uh, recalls that immediately when I sit in this spot. Another pro tip, pulling out a significant, a significant length of yarn so that I can progress at least across one side of the needle without having to pull more yarn. I'm actually doing the same thing in my current sweater that's on the needles where I will pull up from the ball and throw some of the yarn over my shoulder. I feel like that gives a good, <clears throat> a good tension, a good gauge, because I don't have to force the yarn with my working hands out of the ball, which I tend to do if the yarn gets short. 
I think I saw my friend Maria doing that once with a lot of strands over the shoulder to make for smooth stitching across a row or in the round. I really want to honor this extra time that I have away from work without any scheduled obligations. I know there are many people that work the day after Thanksgiving and for some it's the busiest time of the year. I'm the opposite. I'm heading into what I lovingly call my December downtime. I'm being very, very considerate of the activities or lack of activities that I'd like to have in my December, in the month of December. This is something intentional I've been doing for the last few years. I just try to say no to things unless I feel like they're going to be fulfilling in some way or if it's an actual obligation. But I aim to spend a lot of December time when I'm not working just feeling peaceful. That's <laughs> all it is. I'm not going to fully hibernate. In fact, I feel like it's peak making time especially towards the very end of the year, things really slow down. I embrace that, and so I don't sign on for a whole lot if I can help it. One other reflection as I'm making this, I'm getting a lot out of this hat project. I have to say I'm very gratified. Something else that's come up is as I'm working with the fabric more, I realize that I really like the softness and the warmth of this combination of a wool strand and a mohair silk strand. It's very popular. This is not something new to many of you, I'm sure. I don't know that I would want a whole sweater in it, but I am thinking that I would like a, um, a headband. I started watching a new podcast, and the podcast host is called Amy, who goes by Knee Knits, and I will link Amy's podcast below. Amy actually talked about gift knitting in one of the recent episodes and it was aimed at small projects and she gave specific pattern recommendations and one of the first recommendations was for these headbands with a really cool cross feature that you can wear to the side or in the front and it's a tube that you then, you, you knit a tube and then you twist the ends to make this really pleasing little knot. And as I was looking at this fabric, I thought this would be a really nice fabric for an ear warmer like that. I wouldn't wear it so much as a headband like an accessory, but it would be a great ear warmer for an early morning walk perhaps. And this would be good for some wind blocking. We're going to go with this old school ruler and measure. So the brim, I said earlier I thought it was about two and a half inches, and it is. It's actually two and five eighths. I was not far off. The stockinette portion so far is about four inches. Not bad. So I'm six and a half plus inches into this hat. I think it needs to be at least eight or nine inches tall. Um, I'm planning for a nice, you know, neat crown. Hmm. I'll have to think about what kind of crown I want to do. I think well-considered crown shaping really makes a hat. Greetings, friends. It's about 4.30 p.m. on Friday. And I tell you what. It's looking like this hat will be finished soon. I have started the crown decreases and I can remember still the moment earlier today when I thought, oof, I feel like this hat is probably going to take me a couple of days. And, uh, and it, I don't know why, it was something about how much was on the needles at the time and I thought, well, that's fine. 
I mean, I had a plan to do it in a certain amount of time, but if it takes me longer, that's okay. The knitting is enjoyable. And then after I measured it in the clip from earlier, I realized, oh, actually, <laughs> I'm probably almost there. So I am using crown decreases from a pattern by a friend of mine. Marina Skewa has done several patterns and um, she's a great designer. And I knit one of her colorwork hat patterns and I was very impressed with all the little details, the, the information on the cast on and the tidy way in which the crown is decreased, all of that. It's the Aspis hat by Marina Skewa. I enjoyed knitting that. I would actually knit it again, um, even for this purpose, as a hat to gift or give away. So my mind just went to, oh, that was an experience that was a really easy crown set of decreases and my numbers closely matched. I did adjust my stitch count a little bit just to be able to use the recommendations for stitch count in the pattern. And I'm using markers at each decrease point so that you have like this nice even set of spokes that go toward the crown. I'm on my porch and I'm so paranoid that some mosquitoes have gotten in because they love me. So the markers, got some, I've got some cute ones on here. I use the markers to indicate where I make the decreases. Um, one of these is from John Arbin, as designed by my friend Katie. And it's making for a nice, slightly textured crown decrease. I am most of the way there. I think I'm going to finish this hat tonight. My stitch gauge came in at four and a half stitches to the inch, which was about what I had guessed in the beginning based on the needle size and what typically happens when you combine a DK weight and a lace weight mohair silk. It's kind of like a, I guess I would consider that a heavy worsted gauge. And I really like the fabric, as I said earlier, so I would do this again. I'm very excited to think that I could finish this hat tonight. Do you find that part in a project where you look at it one minute and you think, this is gonna take forever. I am now fully in the slog. And then what feels like the next minute, you're like, oh, I can see the light at the end of this tunnel. <laughs> so I'm gonna be really proud to share this with someone. I did try it on and that was probably not a good idea because I love the color, I love the fit, I love the feel. That's neither here nor there. <laughs> <laughs> it just helped me realize that it was a good time to start the crown decreases. So I will be back. Most likely I will come back with an update uh, after I have finished the knitting. And then I have one more tip or trick that I like to use specifically for hat knitting that I will share with you. 5.13 p.m. Back inside away from the mosquitoes. Sun will probably set within 30 minutes. <laughs> last set of crown decreases. Time for the tapestry needle.
Good morning, friends. I'm back. I think today is final day of hat making. I have a hot coffee waiting for me, so I'm going to share with you the final tip and then go enjoy this. For the final tip in this hat making process, this has everything to do with finishing, blocking your hat. I saw this tip from Wooly Wormhead many years ago and tried it, loved it, done it several times. For this particular type of blocking, which is to even out the stitches in this hat project, kind of open things up if that's what's needed, and make it look nice and neat when it's dry. You're going to need a balloon. I've got two sizes here, a larger one and a smaller one, just to show that this will be relative to the size of your hat. So if you're using this technique for a small hat, like a baby toddler size, you'd want a smaller balloon. And for a larger hat, teens through adults, you'd want a larger balloon. And optional uh, implement is a clothespin. What I do is I wet block my hat. So I soak to the hat overnight and then I roll it in a towel and actually step on the towel to press all the water out. So this is pretty damp right now. And I can already see after last night's soak that still a nice halo on there, but this is just kind of relaxed and everything, everything is looking like a uniform fabric. So one of the reasons I use this trick is I don't like for my brim to stretch out. Even if I've done a ribbed brim, which does have elasticity and will pull back, I don't like to stretch it out in the blocking process. The other reason I like this technique with the balloon is that I can kind of control how much spread happens in the blocking of the hat. So what I do is I start partially blowing up the balloon but I keep it smaller than my final hat circumference so that I can stick it inside the hat. It's like, it's like getting the balloon dressed. <laughs> I, I kind of center the crown at the top of the balloon if I can. You see the brim is hanging around the smallest part of the balloon here, which is good, that's what I want. So once I've got the hat on there, then I blow up the balloon some more just to the point where I think the fabric is still intact and not being overstretched. Now I can see a bit of the balloon showing through so I feel like that's wider than I want these stitches to be. So I little little bit of air out. Now, if I have something happening at the brim that really needs specific blocking, like, I don't know, a lace pattern or a cable or something, I am careful to layer the hat onto the balloon in a way that all parts of it get the treatment that I want. Like I said with ribbing, if I don't want that stretched out, I'm gonna let the ribbing hang down at this smaller part so that it doesn't get any stretch in the drying process. So I basically fiddle with it. Because the hat is damp, as I'm fiddling with it now, you know, it's fine if I change position and things like that. I try not to tug on the hat too much. I don't want it to be floppy. This fabric is, it's pretty drapey after a wash, which is nice. It's, it kind of moves. So there we go, it's on my balloon. So the balloon bottom surface is not flat, but I could sit this in a bowl. I could just lean it up against something to kind of dry somewhere that has good air circulation. Um, but what I like to do, and the reason I said the clothespin is optional, is I like to take the bottom portion here and put the clothespin on it. And then I can, cl I can clip the clothespin to a clothesline. Um, I have a drying rack in my laundry room, and this just 
can hold the balloon and hold on to another surface and let it hang kind of upside down to dry. Now in this case, I don't want to blow the balloon up any bigger, so I'm not going to use the clothespin treatment. There are other times where I've really got the balloon stretching the hat to the max on purpose, and that works really well because it holds it, but in this case, well, I could, I could hang it, but it would mostly be blocking to the brim size. So that works as well, actually, now that I'm looking at it. If I just wanted to blow the balloon up to the size of the brim, I could do that too. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the balloon, leave the hat on the balloon and just let it kind of lean up in a sunny area so that it can block out today. So the thing about the balloon is that it's, it's a good, changeable, easy, inexpensive <laughs> tool. I bought a bag of various sizes of balloons. I've had it for years. Um, I make a decent amount of hats. In my knitting journey, it was one of the first things I fell in love with. So party store bag of uh, balloons in various sizes last, has lasted me a really long time. So yeah, I think for my purposes, because I really like the drape that I'm seeing on this and I don't want to change that, I'm just going to let this lean up against somewhere and dry. So that's your last tip. And that's this project just about done to weave in my ends, and get it packed, packaged up and ready to send off. I am contributing to Knit the Rainbow Inc., which is an organization that supports LGBTQIA plus youth and has programs to help keep them warm in the winter. Many of them are displaced. And they are um, collecting warm winter clothing and one of the local yarn stores that I love, String Things Studio in New York, is one of the collection spots. So my plan is to mail this to them. I have links to all of that in the description box below if you'd also like to contribute in that way. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I have enjoyed having a little focus side project for the last few days, and of course it's always a lot of fun when I get to share it with you, so thanks for being here. I hope you'll come back again soon. Feel free to subscribe below if you haven't already, and I appreciate you sharing your time with me. I'll see you next time. Bye. Mwah.